Good evening, I'm Marlene Harris-Taylor and welcome to The Journal. We recently celebrated the birthday of the nation's most esteemed civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And tonight I'm honored to have his daughter, Yolanda King, as a guest on The Journal. Ms. King is a dynamic speaker and performer. She has performed around the world, sharing her message on the importance of embracing diversity and our common humanity. And she's the co-author of a new book, Open My Eyes, Open My Soul. Yolanda King, welcome to the Journal. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure having you here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Now, you're in Bowling Green to talk to students at Bowling Green State University. And it must be interesting talking to young people who don't have any memories of their own of mm -hmm. your father and just have just seen him in newsreel clips or heard about him in textbooks. Right. I think part of the joy of being able to share, particularly with young people, and the reason why it's so important to me, is to s help make him real and make the civil rights movement and its accomplishments more tangible for people. And because I'm an actress, I choose to share uh, that information by theatricalizing it, by portraying characters and really making the situations and the incidents come alive so that you feel like you're there. One of my, um, one of the highest compliments that I've been paid is by a young person who said, you made me feel like I was actually there in Birmingham, Alabama with the fire hoses hmm. and the police dogs. And, and I was scared, <laughs> mm. you know, and I could see in, in their face that they genuinely were moved by it. So that's part of why, uh, what, of what I'm doing and what I, I did in, in Bowling Green with the students uh, is to really sh make it, hopefully make it more real for them. And, and it must also, seem like uh, ancient history to them. Exactly. I was on the road and a little boy ran up to me. He was about six years old and he was so excited. He said, is it true? Is it true? Are you really Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter? And I said, yes. And he mm -hmm. looked at me as if I was a ghost. Then why aren't you dead? <laughs> You know, I so everybody like, from that era should be dead and gone yeah, in his mind. it's eons yes. of years ago yes. to him at six years old, um, understandably so. Yes. So I think it, it helps seeing me to put it all in perspective that it really wasn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also to to share the the fact that we have come we've come so far, but there are two parts of, of freedom. Mm -hmm. There's getting free, which yes. was done, and then there's staying free. Mm -hmm. And that's an ongoing process yes. uh, for all of us. And there's a now, role is that, what that you, each is that of what us you talk can, about can to play. Students about Absolutely. Going to that, moving to that next yeah, level, the part two. Yeah, that there's, there's much work to be done, and there's something that everybody can do right where you find yourself. Part of what my father challenges, I believe, challenges all of us to do is take a look in our own mirrors and take an honest, hard look at what our attitudes might be and what we're doing in our own lives just to make sure that wherever we find ourselves is as peaceful and, is, and, and there's the presence of justice and, and that it is as harmonious as possible. And so right on college campuses, right in, in workplaces, right in your community, there's something you, right in your home. You may not have to go far. You make sure your home turf is, is harmonious because uh, there's a lot of, un unfortunately, conflict going on in our homes. Do you feel in some way you have come to know him through reading all of his writings? Oh, absolutely. Listening to his speeches Ab now? Absolutely. I mean, I was 12 when my father was taken from us, and, and I'm the firstborn um, of my siblings. And, and my memories of daddy are very clear and very strong and, and, and are really joyous. I mean, my father was a buddy daddy. He did not spend a lot of time telling us what to do and what not to do and disciplining us or imparting even talking about his work and imparting that kind of verbal knowledge. He just lived his commitment, he lived his passion, and he shared his love with us. Hmm. And so, so he didn't bring home, bring home the stuff from the road no, or the things not, that he'd not been dealing with, with to the children. Not, not with us, obviously with my mother, but not with us. With us, he was buddy daddy. He was playmate of the year. He would get on the floor and romp and play ball in the house. My mother couldn't stand it. She would like, <laughs> stop, stop, you know, you yeah. got to break something. And he'd say, okay, Corey, because he called her Corey. Uh -huh. And as soon as she left the room, he'd start up again, you know. And 
And we taught me how to swim and how to ride a bicycle. And we go to the amusement park and ride the roller coaster mm -hmm. and scream. And Martin Luther King was screaming oh, on the roller coaster. Screaming. Me and him <laughs> screaming like two little idiots. <laughs> And, uh, and just giggling and having a ball. And that's so hard to visualize, oh, Martin Luther he, King he, giggling on a roller yeah, coaster, because we, the memories we have are serious. Exactly. And, you know, so, you know, so passionate, so passionate and, about his oh, speeches he was, and so he forth. He was such a cut up. He really, he loved to laugh, he loved to joke. I mean, the day he was, he was killed, about an hour and a half before, in the hotel room, he was having a pillow fight with my uncle and Andy Young and Ralph Abernathy. That's... <laughs> That was Mar that was the Martin Luther King I knew was the one having the pillow fight. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so, uh, so I had to learn about the leader and yes. the spokesperson and the, serious and civil the human rights, figure, rights. Yeah. yeah, leader and So and why so don't forth. we know more about that side of him? I mean, it's so wonderful to hear these well, stories. Well, you know, that's what happens. You there there's a unfortunately when people become heroes in our minds, they become sort of sanitized and and they are on a pedestal and, and, and not accessible. And, and one of the things that I seek to do is to, is to make, again, make daddy more real for people mm -hmm. and, and more, uh, you know, more human because he was human, uh, definitely. And, and could have been a, a stand-up comedian if, <laughs> if he hadn't been called to do something different. Now you mentioned the hero. Thing. You know, the fact that he is this great figure, he's this hero, there's a holiday named after him. And I imagine that must be such, in some ways, a heavy load to carry as his child for you mm. and your siblings. Is mm. it difficult to be the heirs to that legacy? Well, it, it has it, tremendous, uh, incredible blessings. Uh, people love you and they don't even know you mm -hmm. because they appreciate so much what my father and my mother have contributed. Um, but there's also a, an awesome responsibility that it also imparts. And, and there are expectations. When I was a younger person, I tried to meet all those expectations because I was a bit of a people pleaser. And really? So what did you do to try well, to meet them? You know, people that invite me here and invite me to be a part of this cause and to come attend this march and this event and so forth. And I was just like running like a chicken with my head cut off in it all felt these like different you couldn't directions. Say no. I could not say no. Mm. And, and, and I wasn't really, I feel, it, making, because I wasn't clear about what I really believed and felt and the things that were really resonating with my spirit, I, did, I was feeling inadequate a lot. Mm. that people were expecting me to to know about this and to have the answers and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't. I didn't. I was searching, too. I was a young person, and I was looking. And uh, so there were many times when I was way out of my comfort zone. Mm. And um, But you you learn when you are stretched like that. You you learn quickly, and you... Uh, and you and you grow, and I've grown in be, into really being very clear about what it is that I uniquely bring to this incredible legacy. So you've found some peace with it. Oh, absolutely. Now, are you a married lady? No, I'm not. You're no, single. I'm not. And so, when you were saying all this, it made me wonder too about how do you date mm. as Yolanda King? Because you know they say so many of us, so many women, that we're really looking for our fathers. Mm. You know, we find a husband, mm. and in my own husband, I do see. Mm -hmm. You know, my father in him a little bit. Sure. So how does man live up to Dr. Martin Luther King when he's dating <laughs> Yolanda King? Well, obviously it's tough since I haven't, <laughs> I haven't uh, found the one. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had some wonderful and known some wonderful men and very close, um, still very close to, to them. Uh, they're still, they're, we're friends, but um, it's been difficult to find the one. I think it is difficult to to, as a man particularly, to follow and, and to be a part of that legacy, you kind of, you know, there's a tendency to maybe be Mr. K, you know, Mr. King. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to be really, really strong in yourself and um, really clear in your convictions and secure. And, and that's tough sometimes to find. Mm -hmm. I'm still keeping even if hope you're not alive, Yolanda though. King. That's even if you're not, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it must be even tougher yeah. as Yolanda King. But I'm keeping hope alive. <laughs> I really am.